here. If you guys are joining us online, um, welcome as well. Glad to have you guys jumping on. Um, we are in the book of Colossians. So if you guys want to grab a Bible, you guys can go ahead and turn there. Colossians chapter 1. That's where we'll be this morning. In case you missed last week, just to kind of bring you up to speed on where we're at in the book of Colossians, Paul is in prison and Paul has never been to Colossae. He's never met these believers. But the, the man who helped to plant and the man who leads the church in Colossae, his name is Epaphras. And Epaphras came to Paul in prison with a message that there were some false teachers that were starting to try to pull away some of these young believers out of the church. And the message they were preaching was one of a denial of the deity of Jesus. So they were denying that Jesus was God. And, and so Epaphras runs to Paul and he's like, man, I need your help. Here's what's happening. And Paul writes this letter to remind the young church, to remind the young believers what it is that they believe, what they know to be true about Jesus. So Paul begins the letter by affirming their growing faith. He, he affirms in them their, their growing faith in Jesus as well as their love for one another. He said, I, I've heard that you guys are, are growing and that you're, that you're loving one another well, and there's, there's gospel fruit that is resulting in the way that you're living. He reminds them of the power, that power of the gospel that's changing their world. And how their lives, the way that they've been living, have been drawing people to the beauty of the gospel. So he's reminding them of that right out of the gate. Just, hey, remember, right? And it's all because of the hope that you know is coming, that eternal hope. So hold on to that and, and let it continue to shape you and, and affect how you live. And then he moves on in our passage this morning. He moves on to a very specific prayer that he's praying over the young church. A very specific prayer. And one that we can be praying even so today. So let's read Colossians 1, 9 through 14, and see this prayer that Paul prays over this young church. Here's what he says. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So here's our big idea. We're taking it straight out of the text. Here's the big idea. Our big idea is that our prayer is that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's coming straight out of verse 9. Because, because we want to be praying the same prayer. We, we want to be about the same thing that Paul is about as he's praying this over them. So our prayer is that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So if the slide changes before you get it, which I don't think it will, but you can just go to verse 9 and just write verse 9 down. Like That's our big idea. So Paul transitions out of this first section and he transitions with an and so, which is essentially a therefore, right? We have, Paul says, we have heard of your faith. We'd, we've heard of your love. We've heard of the fruit that the gospel is bearing in your lives. But we've also heard of the opposition that you face. We've heard of, of the false teachers and the false gospels. And since that day, since the day that we've heard about what's going on, we have not stopped praying for you. And here's what we're praying, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So let me ask you a question. When is the last time that you prayed that over somebody? I, I, I don't know that I could have answered that before this week. Like that's a pretty deep spiritual prayer that you would pray over somebody, but that's not really how we're we're taught to pray. Maybe that's not how prayer has been modeled for us. There's this, this needs-driven prayer culture, right, where it's, it's, you know, I need something because of my job. I need something because of health. I need something because of money. Like, I, there's something that I need, and so we pray for those needs, which is good and important, and we need to pray for those things. But the benefit for all of us, if our prayers were, were more directed towards spiritual growth, towards um, towards the, the, the knowledge and wisdom and understanding of God for ourselves and our brothers and sisters are, are great. The benefit would be great. So let's talk about what this means. What does it mean to be filled with the knowledge of his will? 
Because the will of God is something that we don't like to talk about because it's the mystery, right? Like it's a mystery and we don't, we don't know what God's will is. Like it's in the future and we don't understand it. But here's what, here's what Paul means. The word filled, it has a two-layered meaning. One, it carries the idea of being fully equipped. So they used it like a ship that was, that was ready for a voyage. It was packed to the brim, ready for a voyage. So filled, that's what that word filled means. It was prepared, it was equipped. But then if you go a layer deeper, it also implies that that being filled had a controlling effect. That's the implication of that word. So there's a, there's a being filled, but there's a controlling effect. What are they filled with? They're filled with knowledge, which is a Greek word that means knowledge gained by experience. It's not just facts. It's not just knowing about God, but it's being filled with experiences that, that you have had because of the presence of God. So it's an experiential knowledge. And then his will, the will is what one wishes or determines shall be done, right? A, a desire for something, something that's set in motion by God. So you put all that together, filled, knowledge, will, and here's what we get. Paul's prayer is that the believers would be, would be filled by experiencing God in such a profound way, such a profound way that it would literally control the way that they lived, that they would be driven by a deep understanding of the desires that God has for their lives. So his will is that they understand, here's how God wants me to live. Like, this is his desire for my life. So this is Paul's prayer, and this is the same prayer that we should pray for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then, the main points for today, we see varying effects that this has in our lives. So there are, we're going to see five, four effects, maybe five, four and a half, we'll get to that. But there are these effects that come as a result of being filled with the knowledge and understanding of the will of God. So what are the effects, right? So as to, Paul says, right? I've been praying for this, verse 10, so as to, so that you will, number one, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's the first effect, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. This is some really cool word usage here, but the picture being painted in the original language carries an idea of the, of the scales being balanced. This is what this word picture means. So what is on one side of the scale, think of like one of the old school scales, you know, with like the, the, the chains and like the two little baskets, like that's kind of the scale we're talking about, right? So what, what's on one side of the scale should be equal in weight to that which is on the other. They should be balanced. That's what it means to be counted worthy. So Paul is applying this concept of balance to the spiritual realm. Like that's where he's, where's he applying this? So our manner of life, the way in which we live, must be equal to the character of God. So the way that we live must be at the standard that God has set in place. It must be of the same worth. That's what it means to be counted worthy. But this seems impossible. Like, how can I, how can I, a broken human being, ever come close to living at the standard set by our Lord? How could I ever, how could I ever balance the scales? It's impossible. But when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see who we were. He sees who we are in Christ. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the fourth point. So I'll save like the exegesis of that idea. But walking in a manner worthy means our life is a reflection of the standard of God. It is balanced. It is worthy of that. So in the meantime, before we get to that fourth point, the Bible gives us a lot of insight into what a life worthy would look like. In Ephesians 4, Paul says that a life worthy is one of, marked by humility, by gentleness, by patience, by love, and by unity. You can go read Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 and see that. Here in Colossians, we see that there's a knowledge, there's joy, there's thankfulness, there's fruitfulness. That's a life that's, that's worthy. In Romans, we see that purity. And then in 1 Corinthians, we see that, that contentment. 2 Corinthians, we see faith. Ephesians, righteousness, living in light, wisdom, truth. We see all of these, these characteristics of a life that is marked by someone who is living in a manner worthy of the Lord. So if these are, if these are the, the things that mark your life, then, then you're doing a pretty good job of balancing those scales. But it's only because, again, we'll get to it, but the power that we have because of the Holy Spirit that we can even attempt or begin to balance those scales out. 
So Paul is praying that these young believers would live at the standard set by Jesus, right? Like, don't let the world around you influence the way that you live. Don't buy into the schemes and the false gospels around you. Don't let culture dictate what you do with your money, how you spend your time, what entertainment permeates your heart and mind. Let it be influenced by the word of God. So picture a scale, right? Picture one of these old school scales. And picture yourself on one side and picture on the other side the standards that God has laid out on the other, right? Like this is the standard that God says. And ask these questions. I had to ask him as I was typing them, right? Like ask these questions. Does the media that I consume bring the scales into balance or does it weigh me down? Does my time management prove a priority of the things of God or do the activities in my downtime pull me away from Jesus? Does the way that I treat my wife, husband, or kids reflect biblical attitudes and values? Or am I damaging relationships by the way that I handle my responsibilities? Am I pursuing Jesus, right? This is the big, the big, the big question. Am I pursuing Jesus and allowing him to work in me so that the scales are balanced? Or am I tipping the scales by living for myself? So our prayer is that you, we, would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's what that looks like. And the second effect of Paul's prayer for this church is that they would bear fruit in every good work. That they would bear fruit in every good work. The good that we do, this is what this means, the good that we do should be for the benefit of others. It should be for the benefit of others. This is, this is speaking to benevolence. Like we are intentional with how we treat and serve other people so that kindness is felt and others are better because of our good works. So there's no room here. There's no room in what Paul is saying for selfish gain at all. There's no room for that. The fruit that is born out of good works has the gospel as its center. So it can't be for selfish gain. It's all about Jesus, right? It's gospel fruit. In other words, our good works are a reflection of our relationship with Jesus. People see Jesus in and through us because of the way that we serve, because of our good works. It points people to Jesus. And when we get out of the way and when we let Jesus shine through us, relationships are deepened. Trust is built. Walls come down. There's a lot of people that are skeptical about the things of God, but when we're able to serve and love and it's, and it's in a way that, that people see Jesus, then they, they begin to trust us and, and the, the walls of skepticism start to, to come down and people then become more open to talking about spiritual things and we love them like Jesus, right? So they see something different. And all of this comes from being filled with the knowledge of his will, right? There's the prayer, the effect bearing, good, bearing fruit in every good work. Here's why, right? What does God desire? What would be his will when we talk about this? Well, God's desire is that we care for the least among us. God's desire is that we give our time, energy, and possessions to help others. It says that in scripture. God's desire is that we look after the orphans and the widows. God's desire is that we live as salt and light. It's like what Paul said at the beginning of the chapter, right? The gospel is bearing fruit. The gospel is making a difference. And the, and the fruit that it's bearing is that people's lives are being changed because of the gospel, because of how the young church was living. They're seeing gospel fruit. People are coming to saving faith in Jesus because of how they were living, because of their good works, because of how they were loving and serving other people. So I'm preparing this week and I'm kind of struck with this question of, you know, when was the last time that I helped someone and they saw Jesus through me? And that's one piece of it, but then I went a layer deeper and I'm like, man, when's the last time I served someone and there was intentionality in planting seeds towards gospel fruit? And when did I serve and help someone with the intention of them, of, of a seed being planted? And then another layer, when's the last time my serving turned into a gospel conversation? So I can serve and love, but when did I, when did I take advantage of the conversation and, and start talking about gospel matters? And then even one more, and this was like super convicting, when's the last, last time that my life shined Jesus so brightly that that person made a decision to follow Jesus? Like when's the last time I can say that was true of my life? I mean, I don't want to have to think that hard about it. Like I want, I want to be faced with this and go, hey, last week, here's what, here's what God allowed me to do. He gave me this opportunity and gospel fruit came out of that. 
I want to have stories like that, and I want stories like that to just, to just flow out of, of this church. So our prayer, as Paul's was, is that our good works, the way we serve and love, would bear gospel fruit. And then the third effect of the prayer is that we would increase in the knowledge of God. Increase in the knowledge of God. Now, we've talked a little bit about experiential type of knowledge um, in, in, the, in the original prayer. But the knowledge that's mentioned here is, is kind of all-encompassing. It's not just experiential. There's an intellectual knowledge, there's an experiential knowledge, and there's a spiritual knowledge all at play in this definition. So let's talk intellectual knowledge. That would be, that would be a head knowledge, facts, reason. And this comes from reading God's word, right? We learn facts about, about history, and we learn about the church, and we learn about God. Like there's, there's head knowledge, and that's important. It comes from reading books and, and doing, you know, some studying and reading about the history of Israel. We learn a lot about God and the history of Israel. It comes from reading about the history of the church, right, starting in Acts. What, what has God done in his church throughout the centuries? It comes from memorizing scripture, right? We have that hidden knowledge. We know things about God, about his word, knowing the stories of how God worked throughout history. So that's intellectual. It's, it's fact-based. But then there's also experiential knowledge, and that experiential knowledge comes from living our lives and being aware of God in the moments that we go through. I like the way he's working. We see him even in the mundane things. And that's a big struggle for us, I think. We like to look at God in the big moments, like the big things, the, the things that are important, but, you know, the, the big healings or the way he provides, you know, um, for people in, in other countries that are like destitute, like there's, oh, wow, look at what he, that's huge, look at what he did. And we don't often look for him in like the small little tiny things in our lives, in the mundane. But if we look closely, really every moment is marked by the way that God's working, right? That we can see God in every moment of our life. And I pray this often, but just thanking God even for just allowing me to wake up again in the morning. And we take for granted that we go to sleep and then we wake up. Right, But the fact that God allowed me to wake up and have another day to live and walk this earth is like something that might seem just kind of trivial and small, but I thank God for it every day. And we pray, right, and we see God answer prayers. But sometimes we pray and we wait for an answer, but we feel God's presence in the waiting. So we know he's there as well. And so we learn more about him, right? We learn more about his character. He, we, we learn how he works in our lives, and that's an experiential knowledge. We experience God in the small, in the big, and that teaches us a lot about him. Then there's a spiritual knowledge, but this can only come from the Holy Spirit that indwells us. It's the only way we can have spiritual knowledge. It's a, it's a supernatural discernment. It's a supernatural conviction that comes from the Spirit. We're, we're in tune with him. We have surrendered control of our lives and we follow as he leads. We recognize his voice and we can tell the difference between our fleshly desires and the spirit's leading. But that only comes if we, if we are a believer and we have the spirit indwelling and that's that, that supernatural knowledge and discernment shedding light on scripture and bringing understanding to it. So our prayer is that you would increase in the knowledge of God. You would increase in, in knowledge in all of those ways. Read, learn, grow experience God, look for him, and recognize when it's him working and moving and, and thank him and praise him for that and, and lock that away as, wow, this is how God has worked in my life. And the spiritual knowledge is resting in, in the fact that you have the spirit indwelling and he's going to give you that discernment and you need to pursue more of God and, and become closer and, and begin to recognize what are the voices of, of the enemy that are trying to lie and deceive, but what are the voices of the spirit that are, that are trying to pull you and draw you closer to God. And so we grow and we grow and increase in the knowledge of God. Then we come to the fourth effect. And this almost, you could argue, being a cause rather than an effect, because it's how we're able to pursue Jesus and grow in faith. It's how we're able to even do that in the first place, but it's also a result of our growth. So for the sake of fluidity and congruency, let's just keep it as an effect, not to confuse things, all right? But know that it could also be a cause. All right, so number four is that we're strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. We're strengthened with all power. And this is what I was talking about. We were going to go back from point one. Right, about, about being able to walk worthy and, and being counted in, in balance with God. The only way is because of the power that dwells within. Now, here's what Jesus said Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
My grace is sufficient because in your weakness, my power will shine. And Paul shares this, and then he boasts in his weakness. Because in his weakness, the power of Christ is shown. He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am at my weakest, I'm actually my, at my most strong because I'm fully dependent and relying on the power of God alone to get me through. And then Jesus takes it a step further in John 15 by saying that apart from him, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We are paralyzed without Jesus. We, it doesn't mean that we can't literally do anything in our life. Like that's not what that means. But what Paul is getting at is that anything that is Christ exalting, anything that is kingdom furthering work, we are incapable of living that out our Christian calling apart from the power of God. So anything that is kingdom-minded, anything that is, that is gospel-centered, anything that is for the, for the glory of God and the furthering of his kingdom, we are incapable of doing anything apart from the power of Christ. We cannot in and of ourselves, in our humanity, do anything to further the kingdom without the help of the Spirit and the power of God. That's what Jesus says. Without me, you can't do anything. So that power that we have, but this is a good thing for us. It's a good thing because we're able to do much in the power of God. And when we do, the only one that can receive credit is God himself. We can't take credit because we didn't do it. If we could do it in our own power, then what would we need God for in the first place? So it's because of that power that we're able to do anything. So as I, as I grow in the revealed knowledge of his will, his desires with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, I'm being strengthened to, to do what? To bear the burdens of other people. To, to walk the difficult season that I'm in and, and continue to glorify God along the way. I couldn't do that in and of myself. How can I walk through a difficult season as a broken human being and, and glorify God and find joy and peace and comfort in the difficult season if, if I didn't have the spirit or if I didn't have God or know who he was? How could I get through that and give God glory and, and find joy in that? That's because of the power that we find within. And why does Paul pray this specific effect over them? You see it in... Um, in verse 11, strengthen with all power for all endurance and patience with joy. For all endurance and patience with joy. So the road is long, right? The road of life is long and the journey is hard and the terrain is rocky and there isn't much, by the way, of true rest. We might have short seasons of it, but part of the curse is like you're working and there's pain and it's exhausting and you're gonna do that your whole entire life. Like it's a long journey that we're on. And we fight and we step forward and we trust God and then we fail. And then we, we try to trust him some more and we fight and we step forward and we fail. And, and then God works and, and, we, and we start to trust again, but then we hit a roadblock and we fight and we fight and day in and day out. And this is, this is like the journey of life and it's exhausting. And, and only by the power of God, only by the power of God can we overcome, can we endure. It's the only way. And not only that, but there's this supernatural joy that we all will experience, which is so bizarre, like in the moment experiencing joy, but it's beautiful that we can experience that. So all power, Romans 6.11 says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The spirit of him who raised, right? The power that raised Jesus from the dead is more than sufficient to get us through our afflictions. If it can raise Jesus from the dead, it can surely get me through the tough season. That power is strong enough to overcome. So that's an effect, also a cause of us being able to live that way, right? So our prayer is that you are strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Strengthened with all power, that power that resides within. And then there's one more effect that Paul talks about, but really I think this is an effect of all the others combined. You take all of those effects of the prayer, here's the prayer, here's the effect of growing in wisdom and understanding, and here's an, an effect of all of that. And what does he say? In verse 12, he says, give thanks to the Father, right? Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance. So, so giving thanks so as you are growing, as you are experiencing God, as you are bearing fruit, as you are walking and, and striving to live in a manner worthy, give thanks to God along the way. Why? Because he has qualified you to share in the inheritance. He has qualified you. It all, all of it leads to an outpouring of gratitude. All of it. 
And I love what Paul does. He could have just said, and, give, and giving thanks to the Father, period. Like, he could have ended there because that is good. Like, yes, all of this leads to giving thanks to God. Thank you, God, for, for allowing this in my life, for, for moving me in, in this direction, for, for giving me your, your spirit power to, to overcome and to live. Thank you. But he doesn't just stop there. I mean, it could have made sense, but, but instead, why not inject another little reminder of who Jesus is and what he did in their lives? Why not just put that in there as, as emphasis? But I love this letter because all throughout you just see Jesus just injected here and there. And then next week it's like all Jesus. But I love it. So here's what it means to be qualified. To be qualified means to be made adequate, to be made sufficient, or to render competent or worthy. And Jesus did that. God sent Jesus to die in our place to make us enough. We grow up, right? We grow up and we go to school for a long time. Some of us then go to college and you get a degree, right? Some of us then go to graduate school and that's where I'll stop using us, okay? But some people then, they get a PhD and then some people get multiple PhDs and some people like never stop getting them. And it's like, you don't have any more room on your wall, man. Just give it up. But all along the way, there are tests and examinations that render us competent or worthy of the degree that we have worked hard to obtain. But we don't have to do anything to be counted worthy by, by God because we are qualified because of the work of Jesus. I don't have to work to be qualified. I don't have to work to be counted worthy. Jesus did it. God looks at Jesus. God looks at us and he sees Jesus in us and he goes, okay, you're qualified because Jesus took it and he did it for you. I don't have to do it. Like how great is that, right? Give thanks to God who qualified you. And what did he qualify us to share in? The inheritance. And we talked a lot about this last week, that future hope, the inheritance. But Ephesians 1, right, the spiritual blessings, future eternity in the presence of Jesus. That's what we inherited. A new heaven and a new earth with no pain, with no sickness, with no death. I can't wait for that day. And he's delivered us out of darkness, Paul says. Out of the domain of darkness, right? The domain. Here's what a domain is. It's an area. It's a territory owned or controlled by a ruler or government. So what is the domain of darkness? Satan, the ruler of darkness, the spiritual darkness that we are all born into, held us captive by our sin. He was our ruler. But Jesus, Jesus died to bring deliverance from our sins. And this word deliverance, I love this word. If you guys have been here for a long time or if you're just visiting or you're new, like I love original language. I think it's, it's so important and it's so much better than our English translation sometimes. But here's what deliverance means. Deliverance refers to snatching from danger. So it's not like, hey, I, I, you know, I came and I delivered you. Like, it's like Jesus snatched us out. He snatched us from danger. He pulled us out so fast that Satan didn't even know what hit him. Like we were just gone. The blood of Jesus snatches us out of the hands of Satan. And then what, what happens after that? He transfers us into the kingdom of Jesus in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So even if, even if like the prayers before that in verse 9 through 12 or 9 through 11 are like, those are great. If you can't get pumped up looking at what Jesus did for you, then I don't even know what I can say to pump you up anymore. Because looking at him just like qualifying us, we don't deserve it, snatching us out of that realm and delivering us and transferring us into the kingdom of Jesus for that eternal hope, that eternity, man, it just gets me so fired up. So can you imagine... Can you imagine if we were a people, if we were a church that was committed to praying these things over each other? Can you imagine if this was our prayer? Right, like we, we, we meet every, every Sunday morning at about 9.30, usually 9.40. We try for 9.30, but that's really hard. But we pray together as a volunteer team and we pray specifically for some of the needs in our church. That's really important. We must be praying for one another. We must be praying for the needs in our, in our families and, and, and in those who are, who are here, even in you know, people that we know that we're bringing into our, our prayer circle. Like we need to pray for those things. But we need to also be praying for these things, right? Like the big idea, we need to be praying. 
that we are all filled with the knowledge of his will in spiritual wisdom and understanding, and we're growing and we're growing. And Sunday morning we learn and, and we sing theology and we interact and there's fellowship and Wednesday nights as we break down the text a little bit more, we, we get deeper and we talk about God's word and we're growing and we're growing and we're learning. And as we do that, then we, we're praying that we're walking in, in a balance, right, right, worthy of, of the standard of God. We want to be walking in that way. And if, if anyone we know is, is struggling or, or, or you know, they're, they're really trying, but they, there's something that's crippling them and holding them down and we come alongside and we pray for them and we pray that that God would deliver them and that we would that they would walk in a manner worthy like we're praying that over each other and that that we would have experiences and, and relational connections and, and interactions in our neighborhoods and our workplaces and in our, our kids schools and wherever we find ourselves that would bear gospel fruit we pray that over one another and we pray that we would all be increasing in the knowledge of God that we would read and study and learn and experience God and that we would be in tune with the spirit to be able to discern we want to increase in the knowledge and then that we would be strengthened in all power. Like it's not just like we have the power, but we need, to, we need to use that power. Like we have to rely on it and trust that it's enough to get us through. And so we, we are strengthened and we grow in, in that trust that, that God can, can get us through all because of his glorious might. It's all about God. And then we are thanking God all along the way because of the gospel. Like imagine praying those things over one another. Imagine if that was our focus, that was at the core of our prayers. I'm not saying that that just praying is going to change it, but like praying it and believing it and, and being consistently in prayer for those things. So here's what I want to do. All right. We're going to do that right now. All right. We are, um, we are figuring out how, how, how prayer fits into our, our, our worship services on Sunday mornings. And we've done it a few different ways, but I think this is a perfect time to practice prayer together. So here's what we're going to do. We, we have the five, the five points on the screen. This could be uncomfortable for some, and, and I get that. But we're going we're gonna to kind of circle up into groups of like five or six, just kind of where you're at. And there's five, there's five of these effects. And we are just going to pray these five effects over each other and over this church. All right, so, so we're going to have um, Bill slash my dad. Um, he's going to come up. And he's going to just play a little bit while we're doing this um, because I know that silence is like makes it more awkward. Um, but we're going to just pray together. And he's just going to play. And I, and I just want you to, you could even assign numbers. You could even go, all right, you got one, you got two, you got three, four, and five, okay? And this is what you're going to pray. If you're not comfortable in this setting praying, that's okay. Like someone else in your group could pick up a couple. But let's just, let's just stand up right now. Let's get in some small groups just where you're at. Like just kind of circle up with people around you. And then we're just going to pray together. We're going to pray these five things. It doesn't have to be long. But pray that, pray that these become true of, of those people that are in your circle, that it becomes true of our church, that we are all pursuing this together. Let's pray these things over one another. So go ahead and stand up. He's going to come up and play a bit, and then after this, we're going to sing a song of communion, and then we're going to take communion together. Um, but after, um, after a few minutes, he'll just kind of bring us into a song, and that'll be how, how we end our prayer time together. But go ahead and stand up, find uh, five or six people, and, and let's enter into that time of prayer together.